Welcome to the ninth episode of Check It Out, Carnegie Stout Public Library's Adult Services Podcast. Today, we're going to have a little excerpt from Mike as he interviews Callie White Van Bali about her new book, The Monsters We Make. The book comes out on August 11th. We're going to speak to patron Fran about listening to audiobooks on Libby. And then Ben and Mike are going to chat about Freegal, which is our music service we offer online to patrons. You get five songs a week, and they're going to tell you all about it. We'd also like to give a special shout out and congratulations to local poets Valerie Werdihoff and Connie R. Meester on their poetry collection Sugigami receiving Haiku Canada's inaugural Marianne Bluger Book Award. Hi Kelly, how are you? I'm wonderful. How are you, Mike? I'm I'm pretty good. I'm really excited. Uh, I was talking to Heather Gudenkoff recently and She said you have a new book coming out, and I wasn't aware of it, so I was really glad to hear it. Yes, Heather is wonderful. She is truly a gem. Yeah, and and I'm excited about your new book, The Monsters We Make. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, Um, so this is my third novel, um, and it's a 1980s family drama um, that follows the disappearance of two paper boys um, from a small Midwestern city and the devastating effects the disappearances have on this group of characters who live in the neighborhood. Um, A single mother, her two children, and a local police officer tasked with investigating the investigations. And it's it's inspired by the real life Des Moines paper boy abductions of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin. Most people remember if you've lived in Iowa for any number of years, um, those cases that happened in 1982 and 1984 respectively. Um, And then also a lesser known third case in Des Moines um, uh, of a missing person case of a boy named Mark Warren Allen and that was in 1986 also in Des Moines. So I used the real life paperboy abductions. Uh, I used fictionalized versions of them in the novel and then built my characters and the effects of those abductions around it. And that's, that was the basis for the plot. I was able to uh, get a digital galley and I've, I've read the first few chapters and it seems like you, you must've spent quite a bit of time researching, um, police procedure and the cases and and things like that. I did. I spent, I spent several weeks um, first at the Des Moines Public Library, their downtown uh, central location where they have all the Des Moines Register and the old Des Moines Tribune archives. Um, And I read hundreds, I started out reading hundreds of articles on the cases just to get familiar with um, a lot of their facts and and how things unfolded. Um, And then I expanded my research to sort of nationwide cases during that era of missing children. Um, There were some cases in Omaha and Chicago and the uh, the Atlanta child murders and some cases in New York. Yeah, and I did a lot of reading other books and documentaries, and it was a real deep dive into research for sure. Were you in Des Moines at the time? Do you remember the cases? So when Johnny Gosh, so I grew up in, I'll back up a little bit. I grew up in, um, I grew up outside a tiny town in very rural southern Iowa. Um, It's a town called Bloomfield. It's right on the Missouri border. So it's about two hours south of Des Moines. Um, And I grew up on a farm and my family did not travel very much. Um, We didn't really have the means to do very, I didn't come to Des Moines very often. So I was only seven years old when Johnny Gosh went missing. And I don't really remember that case. I was too young and I was, you know, two hours away. It just didn't, it just wasn't um, as big of a news story where I grew up. But when Eugene Martin went missing, I was nine years old. And I just so happened to be 
on a rare family vacation in Des Moines with my family the weekend he went missing. We were staying at a at an old Holiday Inn on Fleur Drive, which was just blocks away from where he went missing. Um, and he was abducted on August 12th, which what happened to be my sister's 14th birthday. And so the, the Monday morning, um, when the news broke of Eugene's disappearance, it was everywhere. And I had, I have a distinct memory of looking north from the hotel parking lot at the downtown Des Moines skyline and thinking that someone out there was stealing children. And it really shook me. And I had never, it had never occurred to me that that could happen. Um, with my experience of living a very kind of sheltered rural farm childhood. Um, and clearly that moment has stuck with me. It left a real impression. And for 30 years, I, I, I had a real fascination with the cases. Fran Hedeman taught speech and theater and directed theater productions and speech contest events at senior high for 34 years. She is now a busy volunteer at Finley Hospital, the Dubuque Arboretum and Botanical Garden, and the Herb Society of Dubuque, as well as an avid reader. Thanks for joining us today, Fran. It's a real pleasure to have you here. I miss our little chats at the library about the audiobooks you've been loving lately. Yes, I'm a, I do read regular books, but I do enjoy audiobooks. And I, I think that started for me after I spent seven summers in graduate school. And then when I came home to, you know, mundane tasks for the rest of the summer, like mm, doing the dishes or cooking or cleaning, I found that my mind wanted to have something more happening. And so I started audiobooks because then I could multitask and do two things at once. I could enjoy the book and get the other things done. So... I am very thankful that you got me connected with Libby because I failed to check out enough audiobooks to get me through the social isolation and all of the things that have been going on. And when I ran out of audiobooks, I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to weed the garden? How am I going to do all these things without a book to listen to? So now I can just stick my phone in my pocket or take it in my carrier and I can listen to my book and I can do all these other tasks. So I started out because I was not familiar with Libby, actually with listening to some books that I had maybe previously read. For example, the Guernsey Literary Potato Peel Society, that book, I'd read when it first came out a long time ago. But I really enjoyed listening to it and, you know, hearing the voices of the different characters and being able to reconnect with that book in a little bit different way. I listened to Where the Crawdads Sing, which I had not been able to read yet, and I found that one very interesting. My preference is probably historical fiction, and I, I haven't found any of those yet, but I'm working on it. So I, I actually listened to a Patterson and a Grisham, which they're not authors <laughs> that I normally read, but I found a, a couple that I could listen to, and I enjoyed those. I also got to listen to a book that I had given my honorary granddaughter for Christmas, which I was not familiar with, and it was The Librarian of Oswich. And I had forgotten some of that historical information, and she had told me how much she liked the book after I gave it to her. And so now we were able to have a little chat with each other about that book and all the things that happened in it, and that we both learned a lot by listening to it. So that's, that's kind of my story of listening to audiobooks. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Do you have any other questions? Have you found the Libby app hard to use? Are you a big tech person? I am not a big tech person at all. And what I, I truly like about the Libby app is that I can turn the book off, go do something else, come back, push that little 
arrow and it's right back where I was. And sometimes when I was listening to books on CD, my CD player wouldn't stay on or I didn't want it to stay on for an hour or so before I came back. So um, I would have to kind of find where I was again. So with, with Libby, that's pretty easy. The only thing that I haven't mastered is searching for a particular author or a particular title. So right now I'm just skimming through the available titles and uh, picking something out that way. I also like the fact that you can play a little sample and that helps me decide if yes, I want to listen to this book or no, I don't. Previously, of course, I would carry home three or four audio books from the library and sometimes I would listen to a couple chapters and I think, oh, this one's really not for me. So then I would have to take them back and I would maybe run out of books before I made it back to the library again. Mm. So that's nice. So I don't know that I could have done it without your help getting started, but now I'm, I'm pretty good. Well, we love getting people hooked on books. Any way we can get them into your hands. Well, it's great to be able, I mean, I do love to read every day and I do that every day. But uh, being able to listen and get that information while I'm doing something else is a, a real bonus for me. Well, I hope I can tempt you back to the CD audios at least sometimes. I can tell you I've gotten a whole bunch more Charles Todd on their way in. Oh, good. All right. I will be ready for those whenever we can come back or... Um, Maybe I can find them on Libby. Well, and actually, I, I probably will come back to CDs partly. I mean, the only problem with listening on my phone to Libby is that sometimes my battery runs down mm -hmm. and I have to stop and go recharge before I can keep listening. This is just going to give you a way to listen to twice as many books at the same time. Right. That's good. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hey Ben, how you doing? Since we've been home a lot, I've been downloading a lot more stuff from Freego lately. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, for those who haven't used it, it's the library's um, service where you can download five free songs a week on each library card. I, I've been surprised that, I mean, they've got a lot of newer releases on there too. I just recently found uh, the new Fiona Apple album that's getting a lot of attention, uh, Fetch the Bolt Cutters, and then the new Strokes album, which is also getting a lot of attention in media, the new Abnormal. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. Yeah, the, uh, popular music is embracing all things 80s and synthesizers and electronic effects on vocals, but uh, I think the Strokes do it in a really fun way. Uh, that doesn't sound cliched and uh, they still have their old sound. I started listening to them in the early 2000s when they came out when I was almost in high school. And so coming back to them and hearing something fresh that they've done, it's kind of nostalgic, but, and being a child of the 80s, I still eat all those 80s things up. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Yeah, I'm, I'm just always surprised at what I find on there. I mean, they say they have over 3 million songs, like Sony Music, which has a ton of the big names. Yeah. Um, when, I, when we first had it and I first started using it, I was looking at songs and looking for albums, and it was more obscure stuff. And if they did have a big name, it was like on some compilation. But now whenever I go in there, I'm just seeing all these albums on there that I'm like, oh, I'd like to download that. I got to save that for later. Yeah. It's like when you listen to uh, one artist or one song, it, it sort of leads to other stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. Freegal has um, notifications. So if you download your five songs, when your time period is up, I think you get notified that you can, that it's ready for you to download five more songs. Yeah, you get an email every week, which is always a reminder. I'll look in my email. It's like, oh, yeah, I can go. Do you use a website or, or 
Is there, there's an app too. I there is an app. Um, I haven't used the app in years for a while. And that was mainly because I don't keep the music on my phone. Right. Uh, Cause I store it on my computer and then I might put it on my phone later on, but there is an app you can use on your phone and it organizes the music for you. So you can download it and keep it on your phone. I know I've helped library patrons use it somewhat recently and then they, and even ones that you've downloaded before, if you don't have it on a certain device, it lets you re-download the song again if you've already done it and that doesn't count towards one of your five. Um, so, and when I listen to digital music, I'll do it from my computer a lot at home. You wrote a blog post about some of your favorites that you've seen lately. Do you know when that's going to go up on the library blog? Yeah, it should post either this week or early next week. I'll have to, like I say, I'm going to go check out Freegal and see what I can find there. Maybe if I can get some of those Bob Wells songs, I can play something in the evenings at my house. Yeah, besides some of the new stuff, but I mean, some of the other stuff I talk about on the blog, some of my favorites I've downloaded, besides those two new releases, um, I have lots of jazz. I just got um, someday my prince will come by Miles Davis. Oh um, yeah, might, yeah. It might be kind of a classic, but it was new to me. I just the title songs from the Disney movie Snow White, but the way Miles plays it on trumpet is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I imagine. And then I've gotten some other. Uh, I've been. I was on a kick of electronic music for a while. Early electronic music. And I got this one, it's The Unexplained by Ataraxia. Um, and then the, I noticed they have a lot of soundtracks on there. I got the Halloween three soundtrack, Season of the Witch. Uh, John Carpenter and Alan Howarth uh, were big uh, in the electronic music of the 80s. So that's a fun, spooky one. I got that around Halloween time. It was, it's just fun to get lost in there. I'm seriously thinking about <laughs> checking it out. Yeah, I recommend it. It was uh, good to chat with you. Yeah, you too, Mike. All right, yeah. take care. We'll talk soon. You yep. too. Thank you for listening to our episode today. Tune in next week to find out more about summer reading. Special thanks to Ben, Mike, Fran, and Callie for their contributions, and also to Ben Eagle for performing the music in this episode.